I love that. His name shall be Jesus. Isn't that so cool? Like, I think it's amazing that somebody has interpreted the Christmas story um, kind of as it would perhaps look like today. I don't know, I found that really moving when I saw it. I think, I imagine most of us, if not all of us here, uh, are familiar with the, with the story of the birth of Christ. And I love that. Like, I love that our kids still get to do nativities in their schools, in most of them, um, still get to dress up as sheep and shepherds and all the other characters. Um, from a young age, this story, this Christmas story, it's ingrained in us, isn't it? You know, we all know the characters. I'm sure a lot of us can recall the exact words from the Bible. However, I also think it's really important that sometimes, because of that, we can become overly familiar with the story. And I think sometimes we can think, oh, we know all there is to know about the Christmas story. What else is there that, you can, that we can learn from it? But you know, God still speaks through this story today. And I believe this morning that as we stop and as we consider this first Christmas again together, that God is going to speak, he's going to reveal more of his character to us, and he's going to remind us again that he is relevant and present in our lives today just as much as he was relevant and present in their lives that we read about in the Bible. You know, if we were to summarise what Christmas is really about, I think it is, it's about celebrating the gift of Jesus, isn't it? As Christians, that's what we believe. You know, the greatest gift the world has ever seen arrived at Christmas, or the first Christmas. And we celebrate that fact. We celebrate that God Almighty, the God Most High, chose to come as a baby called Jesus who would grow and become the perfect man without sin, fully man, fully God, who would then become the perfect sacrifice in our place. Jesus Christ, light in the darkness. He came as light into a dark, dark world. God with us. And Christmas is when we celebrate his entrance into the world. But as we celebrate this today with all the, all the things that we come to love and associate Christmas with, the sparkles and the food and the presents and everything else, let's remember that the first Christmas wasn't quite like that. It didn't look like it does today. You know, the first Christmas, as we've just seen portrayed in that video, wasn't quite as beautiful. I'm not sure Mary and Joseph experienced all the warm, fuzzy feelings of Christmas that we do at this time of year. Sure, maybe they did at the end. Of course they did at the end when this beautiful baby was born. But what about in the lead up to it? You would, you would have thought that they would have had joy in that too. But more often than not, with the gifts that God gives us, we have joy in retrospect, don't we? Like hindsight is a wonderful thing. How many times do we look back over our life and consider the things that have happened and we can be joyful and we can celebrate because we can see now how God was working and how much better his plans were than our plans but in the moment, we don't always see it as good. When God gives us a gift, at times it doesn't initially fill us with joy or fill us with excitement. Instead, it can fill us with a whole range of emotions, fear, dread, disbelief, anxiety, confusion. And we can actually question God on whether actually this is a gift from him. And so this morning, as we consider this gift that was given to us on that first Christmas. I wanna look at what can we learn from it about the gifts that God has placed in our lives today. And so bearing that in mind, I want us to look at four specific things. And the first thing is this, do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. We're gonna to turn to our first passage. So if you have a Bible with you or if you've got it on your phone, then if you could get that out, and we're going to turn to Luke 1, 28 to 38. If you haven't got one, don't worry. If you need one and you haven't got a Bible, let us know because we'd love to give you one. Uh, but if you don't, then don't worry because the, the scripture is going to come up on the screen. 
So Luke 1, 28 to 38. So we've read just a little bit before this that God has sent an angel to Mary who is engaged to Joseph. And it says this, we pick it up at 28. The angel went to her and said, greetings, you who are highly favoured. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favour with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and he will be called the son of the most high. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be? Mary asked the angel, since I'm a virgin. And the angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come on you and the power of the most high will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. And then just skip to 38, it says, I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May your word to me be fulfilled. And then the angel left her. So here we have Mary. She is engaged to to be married to Joseph. Um, And she's about 14 to 16 years of age, which it's young, but in in those days, it's kind of the, the typical, the usual age to get married. And here she is being visited by an angel, being told that she's going to have a baby. And if that's not enough of a surprise, then then she's told that it's going to be God, it's going to be the Holy Spirit who's going to make her pregnant. I mean, we've read this a lot, right? But let's just pause for a moment and think of the reality of this situation. There Mary was one day just minding her own business, doing some wedding prep, wedding admin, and Suddenly, this angel appears, and first he tells her she's highly favoured. I'm guessing she was delighted at that bit. Then God was like, I'm with you. Amazing. God is with me. But then, you're going to have a baby, Mary. Can you just picture Mary having to go to her mum and dad, having to go to her parents and say, hey, mum, hey, dad, uh, like, I've got something to tell you. I'm pregnant. But it's okay. It's by God. I haven't slept with anyone else. I haven't slept with Joseph. God made me pregnant. I mean, that's a new one, isn't it? <laughs> Imagine that. Poor Mary. Like, I, I mean, I think poor Mary, although God certainly doesn't see it that way. He says that she's highly favoured. Sometimes we get a gift from God that doesn't look like a gift. In fact, it can look anything but inconvenient, embarrassing. It's going to make you unpopular. People are going to doubt what you say. They're going to make you doubt whether you heard God. You might even be looked down on or shunned. People are going to judge you and people are going to make up their own mind. But Mary knew she had heard from God and she knew she was gifted. After the angel went, you can just imagine, can't you, that fear that would have come over her, the worry that she was going to have to to go to Joseph, the man that she's going to marry, the man that she utterly adores and tell him that she was pregnant, but she hadn't done anything wrong. Joseph, you've got to believe me. I mean, what a conversation. She would have been desperate for him to understand. And so how did Joseph react? Let's have a look at our second scripture, which is in Matthew 1, 19 to 29. We read about Joseph's reaction. So from 19, it says, and her husband, Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. Now, when I read this, I was like, how could he divorce her? Because they were only engaged. They weren't actually married yet. But um, the Jewish wedding ceremony um, has two parts. Um, So the first bit was the engagement bit, which was the legally binding bit. And then a little while later, a few months, in fact, then the bride would move in with the husband. So they had done the legally binding bit. So to break off the engagement, he was going to have to divorce her. And then we pick it up from verse 20. It says, But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. Before God told Joseph otherwise, he had come up with the only logical explanation, which was that Mary must have cheated on him. 
She must have had an affair. And he could have easily walked away. In fact, his friends probably were encouraging him to do so. He would have felt humiliated. He would have felt embarrassed, angry, heartbroken. And then an angel came to him and God spoke. Do not fear. Don't be afraid, Joseph. When God gives us a gift, so often, instead of feeling excited, we feel scared. Here we have Mary and Joseph, who would have been terrified, but they heard the voice of the Lord, do not be afraid, I am with you. God is saying, though you don't understand, though it doesn't make sense, take me at my word and do not fear. Maybe you're here this morning and you know that you have been given a gift by God, that he has put a gift inside you, but you're scared. You're scared of people's reactions. You're scared of people's opinion of you. In fact, you're scared so much that you want to keep it hidden. You want to keep it a secret out of fear of what others might think or say. But the Lord is saying this morning, do not be afraid. I am with you. What is it that you're fearful of? For 2024? What is it that is paralyzing you with fear this morning? What is God asking you to do, but you are so full of anxiety that you don't even know which way to turn? God is saying, do not be afraid. Joseph had a choice, didn't he? He could have chosen to say no, and he could have walked away from the gift. And that is what fear can do. Fear can make you turn away from what it is that God is giving you, just like Joseph nearly did. You know, we have a choice to walk towards the gift that God is laying before us, despite what others may think, despite the seed of doubt that you have in your head, despite not being able to understand everything, but knowing that God has spoken and knowing that God is true to his word and he is with us. Be careful You don't allow the fear to rob you of the gift that God is giving. The message of God to Mary and Joseph remains true for you today. Do not be afraid. Perfect love casts out all fear. So number one, do not be afraid. What else can we learn from this story about God's gifts to us? Secondly, God's timing is perfect. God's timing is perfect. You know, after Joseph heard from God that Mary was telling the truth after all, they later found out that they had to um, travel to Bethlehem. So they were in Nazareth and they had to travel to uh, Bethlehem. Now let's remember that this wasn't planned for Mary and Joseph. They didn't plan this. They didn't plan to travel to Bethlehem to have their baby. They had to go. Joseph had to go back to his hometown, which was Bethlehem, to register for the census. That's what everyone had to do at the time. And so to put this in perspective, Mary was in her third trimester. She was heavily pregnant. And Bethlehem was a long way away. In fact, Bible scholars think that it would have taken them about a week to get from Nazareth to Bethlehem. I mean, I've been pregnant a few times. And let me tell you, in my third trimester, I did not want to travel anywhere unless it was to my bed. (laughs) You are exhausted. Don't know if any other women can relate. Grateful, but exhausted. And there was Mary having to travel for a whole week in the hot sun on a donkey about to give birth. Imagine not only how worried she would have been leaving her friends and family and the comfort of everything that she knew at home, knowing that the baby could potentially come at any point. Like her waters could go while she's riding, sitting on that donkey riding to Bethlehem. How uncomfortable and how exhausting. Sometimes we know that God has spoken and we know we are carrying a gift, but things don't seem to make sense. The journey is uncomfortable. The journey is exhausting. If we had our way, we would have birthed this gift a while ago when things made sense. But we walk by faith and not by sight. And we know that God is never early, is he? He's never late. 
he is always on time. His timing is perfect, even when it doesn't make sense. Back in the summer of this year, I applied for a job that um, it was a part-time job in a secondary school that I really wanted, and I prayed a lot about it, and I felt God say, yes, apply for it, go for it. Um, and I really prayed that I'd be successful and that I'd get the job because I really wanted it. But I was also like, God, do you know what? I trust you. Whatever your way is, you know, that's fine. But I really would like the job. And long story short, I didn't get the job. Um, and I was praying on my way home. I remember praying and I was like, that's okay, God, because I did pray and I did say that your ways are better than my ways. And, you know, I trust your plan and, and everything. But wow, like I actually did really want that job, God. Like what is going on? I'm a little bit annoyed. Can I say that? I was a little bit cross. And I was confused. Maybe they'd made a mistake. Maybe they were going to call me and say, actually, we changed our minds. You have got the job. I kind of gave up and let it be, you know, trusted God. And that evening, or it might have been the next, the next day, I got an email and it said that they would like me to come uh, back for an informal interview for another role that they had because they felt that would be more suited to me. And I did end up getting the job and I, and I work there now and I'm so grateful. But my, the point is, sometimes doors are shut and it can feel like a slap in the face. But what we see as rejection, God sees as something better. When Mary and Joseph finally arrived after that long, exhausting journey in Bethlehem, they were like, surely God's going to provide a five-star hotel for us after that journey. But what happened? Every single door was shut. Every door they tried was shut in their face. And they must have been questioning, God, where are you in this? But God had something better. And maybe some of you are here this morning and you know God has placed a gift inside you and you're frustrated because you think that now is the time for that idea that he gave you to be birthed. Or maybe it's the opposite. Maybe God's asking you to birth something now and you're feeling, no, this is not the right timing. If you'd have asked me a week or a year ago, that's fine. Or if you'd ask me next year, that would be okay. Things don't make sense. Doors seem to be closing. And God is reminding you again this morning that his plan might not look the same as your plan. In fact, my experience is it often doesn't look anything like our plan. But his timing is perfect. We have to trust in him. Number three, God specializes in the small You know, I think if I was God um, and I was going to come to earth, you know, just saying, um, that if I was going to come and save the world, I would want to make a bold statement. I'd want it to be big. I'd want everyone to take notice. And yet, what does God choose to do? He chooses to come as a small baby, helpless, vulnerable baby. So many of us, and I include myself in this, we don't always appreciate or value the small things, do we? Sometimes you want to jump straight to the big things. But what does God say? In Zechariah 4, verse 10, do not despise these small beginnings, for the Lord rejoices to see the work begin. Do not despise these small beginnings, for the Lord rejoices to see the work begin. God specializes in the small As I mentioned earlier, in April this year, we started meeting as a Hatfield site. Um, There was about a team of 12 of us at the beginning and um, quite a few kids. And so probably about 20 of us that decided to sort of set this up over in, in Hatfield. And can I just say, these guys who serve with us are amazing. They're incredible. We see week after week after week, our team turn up, putting chairs out, setting up banners, setting up flags, laying the refreshments out, preparing to lead us in worship, sacrificing their time for only sometimes one person to turn up or a handful of people to turn up. I'm the same. Sometimes I spend time preparing what we're going to talk about, as does AJ, and there's like one person there. Like, God, what's going on? Like, I'm being honest here. I can be honest, right? Right? Sometimes I get home and I'm like, what's the point, God? 
When are we going to see you bring these people in that we know are there and needing to hear the good news of Jesus? Like, when are we going to see this? But God says time and time again to us, do not despise the small things. God is working even if we don't see it in the way that we would expect. There's a beautiful gift that he has entrusted us with, and it's small right now, but we are learning in this season to nurture what he's given us, to lay solid foundations, to build relationships, to trust him, to keep giving him our yes, to keep sacrificing what he's asking us to, even when it feels like nothing is happening. Because when God builds it, and he will, in his timing, we will know where we have come from and we will remember it and we will then say that God has built this church, not us. Do not. Do not despise the small beginnings for the Lord rejoices to see the work begin. Typically, when God gives us a gift, He gives us something which we can hold in our hand so we can handle the gift as it grows. It takes, he takes the small things that we offer him and turns it into something big. And I know Mark spoke on this last week as one of the hallmarks. If you missed that, you can look back at it. It was, I I loved it. The way that he posed that question, what is it in your hands? Like each of us has been placed in his kingdom with gifts in our hands. And it might not seem like much. It might not seem enough, but that's the point. God specializes in the small. He takes the small seed, the seemingly insufficient things, and he turns them into something greater than we could have ever dreamed of or ever imagined. We see it all the way through the Bible, don't we? What seed has God placed in your hand as you enter 2024? What gift has he given you? God specializes in the small things. And finally, appearance isn't everything. Anyone else's kids like start judging their presents when they see them? No, it might be just mine. But like some of them are like, whoa, look at that present. It's so shiny and it's massive. And oh my goodness, I'm going to open that one first. Or that one's clearly a book. I'll open that one at the end. (laughs) Or they start opening presents And like, we've got a one-year-old and um, he doesn't really have a clue what's going on when he sees his siblings opening presents for birthdays or Christmas or whatever. Well, he hasn't, last year he was very little. But you know, he is more interested in the wrapping paper and more interested in the packaging than actually the gift that is inside. But some of these presents today as well, I mean, I don't know if it's just me, but it's really hard to get into. Does anyone else have that difficulty? Like some of the presents that you get, like the kids come to me and they're like, can you open this? Even once they've unwrapped it and the twisty things are fine because you can just twist and the toy comes out. But sometimes I feel like you need a whole toolbox, like pliers to open these gifts. And I have to be honest, sometimes I'm like, let's just leave that one. Let's just put that one aside. Let's open another one. <laughs> but sometimes God gives us a gift that doesn't look much on the outside. We have an expectation of what it's going to be based on what it looks like. And we start to unwrap it. And sometimes we have to wrestle with it. And we have to persevere. And we have to not give up. If we're not sure what to do with it, we have to keep persevering. We have to look past the wrapping and the packaging to the gift that's inside. When Jesus came, he was wrapped, wasn't he? But not how we would have expected not in a gold blanket or a gold robe. He was in stable sheets. He wasn't in a shiny palace, but in a smelly manger. And he wasn't clothed with robes and riches, but he was naked in a makeshift crib with the animals around him, amongst the poo and the feed. Some of us have gifts in our hands which don't look or feel or smell how we expected they would. They haven't come wrapped as we thought, or dare we say it, as we would have liked. Maybe you've just lost your job. Maybe you're struggling in your marriage and it's not thriving how you would have hoped. Maybe you're frustrated that you didn't get that promotion or that you're still single despite years of praying for the the partner that you really want. 
And I want to encourage you this morning to look past the exterior and the struggles and to persevere to see the gift that God has blessed you with. Because appearance isn't everything. And so this morning we have hopefully looked at the Christmas story and we have taken from it some things to consider when we look at the gifts that God has given us today. So just to recap, number one, do not be afraid. Do not be afraid of the gift that God has given you. Number two, God's timing is perfect, even if it doesn't make sense. Number three, God specializes in the small. Do not despise these small beginnings. And number four, appearance isn't everything. Let's trust God with what he's given us, even though it might not look how we would have thought it would. And so as the band come up, please, if, they, if you guys could make your way up, I just want um, us to, we're going to finish, and I think that, We need to respond in some way. I believe that God has spoken this morning and I feel like I want to give an opportunity for a response. So if you guys could stand.